Today we're going to be taking a look at SIADH, or the Syndrome of Inappropriate Antidiuretic Hormone Release. Before looking at the condition itself, it's first important to understand how antidiuretic hormone, or ADH, functions within the body. So if you remember, the hypothalamus is responsible for producing ADH, and this ADH is then stored in the posterior pituitary gland before being released into the blood. ADH release has two main effects, the first being to increase vasoconstriction, which basically involves constricting blood vessels to increase blood pressure, and the second being to activate the kidneys, and more specifically, the collecting ducts of the kidneys, which are seen as the end parts of the nephrons. For this second effect, we can take a closer look at the collecting ducts to see what's happening at a more cellular level. What basically happens is that when ADH binds to its receptor on the collecting ducts, it triggers aquaporin-2 channels to fuse with the cell surface membrane, and these aquaporin-2 channels can allow water to re-enter the collecting ducts from the filtrate back into the ducts. Once inside, these water molecules can be reabsorbed back into the blood via channels on the basolateral side of the membrane. And you can see that the overall effect of this process is to increase water reabsorption and therefore maintain blood pressure. Moving on to the condition itself, SIADH refers to an increase in the release of ADH into the blood, and there can be multiple causes behind this. For example, there could be hypothalamic causes, such as a tumour or CNS infections, which directly increase the production of ADH. Alternatively, there could be pituitary tumours or pituitary surgery, which results in more ADH leaking from the posterior pituitary gland into the blood. Other causes may include ectopic ADH sources, and the most common example is small cell lung cancer, where the cancer cells begin secreting ADH into the blood. And finally, there could be problems with the kidneys themselves, such as nephrogenic SIADH, where there's a difference in the aquaporin-2 channels or a mutation, which results in them not functioning properly. Or there could be medications, such as antidepressants, antipsychotics, or excessive IV fluid administration. Let's now take a look at the signs and symptoms which might develop in SIADH. With an increased amount of ADH circulating through the blood, more ADH is free to bind to the receptors of the collecting ducts, and therefore more aquaporin-2 channels fuse with the cell surface membrane. As a consequence, an increased amount of water is reabsorbed back into the collecting ducts, and therefore back into the blood via channels on the basolateral side. And you can see that the overall effect of this is that other ions, such as sodium, become diluted by this amount of water present, resulting in a hypervolemic or a euvolemic hyponatremia. This leads to the symptoms of SIADH, which can include nausea and vomiting, cramps and tremors, or confusion and irritability, due to the imbalance of water and sodium. For the diagnosis of SIADH, we can start off by looking at routine investigations, for example, with urea and electrolytes and we're looking for the hyponatremic effect when sodium levels are less than 135 millimoles per litre. We can then follow this up with serum osmolality and urine osmolality studies. And the main thing we're looking for is a decreased serum osmolality, so a decreased sodium concentration, and an increased urine osmolality where there's less water present in the urine. And both of these effects occur due to more water being reabsorbed. Finally, we may want to consider some imaging, such as CT chest abdo pelvis, to look for ectopic sources of ADH production, which can be seen in small cell lung cancer or other types of tumours. When thinking about the treatment for SIADH, it's important to realise that the management options can be divided into different phases. So for example, we might want to treat the acute hyponatremia, and this can be done through fluid restricting the patient, so basically limiting their oral fluid intake per day which helps to reduce the levels of water circulating through the blood. This can then be followed up with hypertonic saline if necessary, which helps to increase the levels of sodium back into normal range. Secondly, it's important to deal with the high levels of ADH circulating through the blood, and this may be achieved by using ADH antagonists, such as tolvaptan, which basically block the receptors on the collecting ducts, preventing ADH from binding and therefore preventing the aquaporin-2 channels from fusing with the cell surface membrane. And this allows for reduced water reabsorption back into the blood. Finally, it's important to treat the underlying cause, 
So for example, this might be with chemotherapy or surgery for ectopic ADH sources or stopping causative medications in the cases of iatrogenic SIADH. And here we have a quick summary slide outlining everything I've gone through in the video. I hope you found this helpful and I'll see you in the next one.